On behalf of the faculty, welcome to Honors Convocation. At this time, we ask that you all please rise, if you are able, for the singing of our national anthem. Good afternoon, and welcome to the 96th Honors Convocation of the University of Michigan. I'm Martin Filbert, Provost and Professor of Toxicology in the School of Public Health. Please join me in thanking Samantha Williams again for her lovely rendition of the Star Spangled Banner. We've gathered in this first week of spring. <sighs> At least for this afternoon. To recognize and celebrate the accomplishments of students on all three campuses of the University of Michigan. We're also honoring faculty members who make extraordinary contributions to the education of our students. The students and faculty we recognize today represent the very best of the University of Michigan. The Honors Convocation, held just once a year, is a special event on the academic calendar. It provides a time to pause and appreciate the intellectual work that shapes our purpose, the center of our community. The platform party today includes academic leaders from the Flint and Dearborn campuses, executive officers of the university, and deans of the schools and colleges whose students we recognize today. The Provost Council on Student Honors has selected Alison Berry to be this year's student speaker. Alison is a senior of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. She has demonstrated her passion for public service in many ways. As a sexual assault prevention and awareness center volunteer, she facilitates workshops that address sexual assault, intimate partner violence, healthy relationships, and bystander intervention. She also serves as an ally for survivors. Allison helped establish the We Listen, uh, sorry, establish and led We Listen, a campus organization dedicated to promoting respectful conversations between conservative and liberal students on controversial issues. She serves as an elected representative to LSA student government for two years and works part-time in the office of the Vice President and General Counsel. <laughs> that was our lawyer. <laughs> Alison plans to earn a law degree and pursue a career in public policy, including contributing to legislative efforts to support survivors of sexual violence.
Thank you so much for that introduction, Provost Filbert. After the 2016 election, the University of Michigan experienced deep political divides that closely mirrored those in our country. Students on campus of all political persuasions felt distanced from one another, from their professors, and from the administration. After a post-election vigil on the Diag, conservative students on our campus criticized remarks provided by the university administration, inspiring a hashtag not my campus campaign that gained national attention. Racial slurs were posted in dormitories and hate speech was spray painted on the rock. Student activists shouted down an event featuring Charles Murray, who is most famous or notorious for his work correlating IQ scores with economic success. Shortly thereafter, the white supremacist Richard Spencer requested to speak on campus, prompting student protests, including walkouts and marches. This political tension on campus became part of my daily life. As a student at the Ford School of Public Policy, I spent every day in lectures with politically active students on both sides of the aisle. Our classroom conversations were charged with political and personal attacks. Two members of my cohort published a series of op-eds in the Michigan Daily, criticizing students, faculty, staff, and administrators on the basis of political disagreement. The hostility within our school made learning difficult, pitted friends against one another, and dissolved our sense of community. And so I partnered with several colleagues to help create We Listen. We Listen is a nonpartisan, campus-based organization seeking to bridge the political divide. Our mission is to build empathy across the political spectrum through small group conversations. Our ultimate goal is to change the political climate by building a movement of listeners at universities across the country. We believe that understanding people's values and experiences should be at the heart of all political activity. Through We Listen, I have seen firsthand how our students yearn for challenging yet constructive dialogue around issues that impact us as global citizens. I have seen how mutual understanding and the spirit of compromise can flourish when people come to the table to talk about issues like gun control, abortion, and immigration. What does it take to create this kind of discourse? First, it requires dedicated individuals seeking to understand those with whom they disagree. We emphasize the importance of dialogue, not debate. We encourage participants to see one another as people first. One way of doing this is by assuming positive intent, opening every conversation with the belief that those opposite you are also interested in doing the right thing. Second, we stress the importance of being fully present. For a dialogue to be productive, all participants have to commit their undivided attention for one full hour. We know that the temptation to Google facts and prove someone wrong can be strong, but by resisting that urge and listening, really listening, we create a genuine exchange where everyone's views can be heard. Finally, we encourage participants to find comfort in the discomfort of the conversation. We know that some of the greatest opportunities for learning come when individuals are willing to have their own views challenged. That's why we recommend creating a brave space, not retreating to a safe space. This means we build an environment where members are expected to speak up about their disagreement, but do so respectfully. We also acknowledge that everyone in the group is changing and formulating their views over time. This creates a small, collaborative community of diverse individuals who can think critically about the issues at hand. At times, however, it is important to transcend listening and turn to action. This is imperative when powerful individuals deliberately deceive the public with misinformation. In a world where fake news and alternative facts have become commonplace, we all must recommit 
to ensuring a national discourse centered on facts, truth, and justice. We do not have to listen to arguments that are not predicated on good faith. At the University of Michigan, we must simultaneously foster a community that is steadfastly committed to both civil-civic discourse and objective, fact-based problem-solving. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Ali has provided us with an impressive example of how reasoned debate can occur amongst people with different views. I'd like to examine the broader question that this example poses. What is the role of higher education in helping us to develop our skills as citizens in a self-governing society? We each know from experience that human beings have a wide range of views on every subject. We know too that our society is rooted in the idea that we can nevertheless find a way to live together. Contemporary society poses a challenge to this belief. Today it is easy to remove oneself from the give and take of the world. Traditional broadcasting and social media make it easy to retreat from the cacophony of the world, to put ourselves in places or spaces where our own views are reinforced rather than challenged. Universities are powerful antidotes to this isolation. Our mission is to increase and to advance knowledge and to educate those who will carry this advance forward. To do so requires unrelenting inquiry, the clash of ideas, consideration of new views and new evidence and reconsideration of our own firmly held beliefs. Our commitment to this work is rooted in the long-standing belief in the value of the free trade of ideas. Articulated first by Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. in 1919. In Abrams versus United States, he wrote, the ultimate good is better reached by the free trade in ideas. The best test of truth is the power of thought to get itself accepted in the competition of the market. Undergraduate education is designed to help students develop their abilities to participate in the marketplace of ideas. In every field of, stu of study, students are expected to first test ideas, their own and those of others, questioning what is known and exploring alternative explanations. To evaluate information, searching broadly and deeply for relevant evidence, scrutinizing it, and grounding their ideas in the strongest available evidence. Discuss and debate their ideas, listening carefully to the views of others, learning from them, and recognizing the strength of the evidence and the logic of the argument with which they disagree. A Michigan education provides multiple opportunities to engage in this hard work. This, uh, these include science courses in which new discoveries advance our thinking about the world or the universe, social science projects that deepen our understanding of how society works, and arts and humanities performances and seminars that offer new perspectives on the human condition. Work in student organizations and engagement in real-world projects can also lead to re-examining ideas and adjusting one's thinking. In the years since Justice Holmes wrote about the free trade of ideas, society has grown and changed. Political and social movements have challenged established orders, leading us to recognize the need to argument the commitment uh, to the marketplace, uh, the, com the marketplace of ideas, uh, to make it more inclusive. In our debates and discussions, we must ask, who comprises civil society, and whether all those voices are represented in debates and discussions about our common future. Our ability to address challenges effectively and to move society forward depends on inclusion. The marketplace metaphor suggests a bustling and noisy place. 
Debates about issues, including climate change, flag displays, childhood vaccination, all underscore this image. Discussions and debates about contested ideas can indeed be heated. They can lead to anger and distrust, making it difficult to find commonalities. Even civil debate in carefully modulated voices can lead to this difficulty. Rather than hardening our stance when it happens, we are well advised to take time to reflect on the conversation. It is wise to consider outside of the movement what others said and how we responded. This can help us to understand their position and prompt re-evaluation of our own views. It may also lead to discovering areas where agreement or acceptance is possible. In many of your courses, there are opportunities to reflect on what you are learning. Guided by faculty, you can explore how your own assumptions and beliefs are challenged by others. And you can think about how you will respond with evidence, with reason, and with thoughtfulness. Practicing the fine art of reflection provides us with a valuable lifelong skill. As the playwright Lorraine Hansbury wrote in A Raisin in the Sun, never be afraid to sit and think. This is good advice for us all. As a university, we are committed to learning, listening, and re-examining what we believe to be true. The opportunities that the Academy provides for doing so help us to develop a strong foundation for effective engagement in the world. You may wonder how the students we honor here today came to be here. To be invited to attend today's convocation by one's school, college, or campus, a student must attain university honors for both winter 2018 and fall 2018. Seniors who earn university honors for either of these terms are also invited to attend honors convocation. The university honors recognition is awarded to students who earn a 3.5 grade point average during a term while taking a minimum of 14 credit hours, 12 of which are graded credits. I will now introduce the deans from the undergraduate schools and colleges in Ann Arbor. I ask that the dean and the university honors students from that school or college please stand to be recognized. The order of the introductions is in the order of the founding of the school and college. Interim Dean Elizabeth Cole and the University Honor Students from the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts. On behalf of Dean Laurie McCauley, I present the University Honors Students from the School of Dentistry. <laughs> Associate Dean Vicki Ellingrod and the University Honors Students from the College of Pharmacy. On behalf of Dean Jonathan Massey, I present the University Honors Students from the A. Alfred Tobman College of Architecture and Urban Planning. <laughs> Dean Elizabeth Bermoji and the University Honors Students from the School of Education. Dean Scott DeRue and the University Honors students from the Stephen M. Ross School of Business. <laughs> Dean
Dean David Gear and the University Honor Students from the School of Music, Theatre and Dance. <laughs> Dean Patricia Hearn and the University Honor Students from the School of Nursing. Director of Undergraduate Education, Emily Hewitt, and the University Honors Students from the School of Public Health. <laughs> Associate Dean Elizabeth Yackel, and the University Honors Students from the School of Information. Professor Brad Smith and the University Honor Students from the Penny W. Stamps School of Art and Design. <laughs> Associate Dean Tom Templin and the University Honor Students from the School of Kinesiology. And last but not least, Dean Michael Barr and the University Honor Students from the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. Thank you for coming to hear and My boss told me <laughs> that I skipped over a rather large and vocal group. Dean Alec Gallimore. <laughs> and the University Honor Students from the College of Engineering. <laughs> Thank you. Sue Alcock, Interim Provost and Vice-Chancellor for Academic Affairs of the Flint Campus, and Catherine Davey, Provost and Vice-Chancellor for Academic Affairs of the Dearborn Campus, will recognize and present the University Honors Students from their campuses. Interim Provost Alcock. Will the University Honors Students from the University of Michigan Flint Please stand and be recognized. Congratulations. University honors a 3.5 GPA average during a term while taking a minimum of 14 credit hours, 12 of which are graded credit. That's no mean feat. That is a high bar. You have done something not easy to achieve. I am proud of you. Your teachers are proud of you. Your university is proud of you. Your families are proud of you. If you were driving down a highway right now, you would be passing huge billboards flashing. We are so proud of you. So, so feel the glow and enjoy the moment. Now, the theme of this convocation, civility, dissent, and compromise in a divided world, is a difficult one. Navigating these waters is tough, always will be tough. So it's a good thing that students of the University of Michigan Flint, such as the folks just standing here, stand ready for that challenge. Nomen est omen. That's Latin for your name is your sign, your name is your destiny. It's all in your name. And there is very little that is tougher than the stone we call flint, a hard, sedimentary, cryptocrystalline form of the mineral quartz used by humans for countless millennia to make tools to live and thrive. Things made from flint or formed in flint, like the students here, are guaranteed durable, sharp, and made to make a difference in our world. Nomen est omen. Congratulations again to you and yours.
I call on the university honor students from the Dearborn campus to please stand and be recognized. University of Michigan Dearborn students, today we formally recognize you for your impressive academic achievement. This recognition is well earned and well deserved. Through your many and varied accomplishments, you represent what a University of Michigan education is all about. Through your scholarly work, and engaged activities, you enrich the intellectual climate of the entire Dearborn campus. Our campus is well known for its metropolitan vision and impact. As you receive university honors today for your scholarly achievements, I applaud you for your deep involvement in and commitment to civic and community engagement to achieve your exemplary academic achievements while contributing to the common good on campus and in the community is truly remarkable and most deserving of recognition. You do great honor to the University of Michigan Dearborn campus and I call on all members of this academic community to recognize and celebrate your great work and many accomplishments. To all of today's honorees, I offer hearty and heartfelt congratulations. In addition to university honors, the university recognizes superior academic achievement with two other awards. The William J. Branstrom Freshman Prize was created in 1960 by Mr. Branstrom, attorney and philanthropist of Fremont, Michigan, whose desire was to promote excellence in education. Through his generous gift each year, the University of Michigan is able to recognize and encourage first-year students who obtain a high level of academic achievement during their first semester. First-year students who rank in the top 5% of the school or college in which they are enrolled and earned 14 credit hours or more are recognized as winners of the William J. Branstrom Freshman Prize. Will the first-year students designated as win winners of the William J. Branstrom Freshman Prize please, please stand? Congratulations. And now I would like to introduce you to the James B. Angel Scholars in attendance. We award this honor named for the university's third presidents to students with an all A record for two or more consecutive terms in which they carry at least 14 credits per term, 12 of which are graded credits. I would first like to ask our two-term angel scholars seated, seated in the audience to please rise. Congratulations, you may be seated. Today we are paying special tribute to those students who have completed three or more consecutive terms of all A's. I invite all three, four, five, and six term angel scholars to come forward and be greeted by President Schlissel and myself. You, yeah. You will be escorted to the stage by our faculty marshals.
It is now our special privilege to recognize the angel scholars with us today who have sustained the highest level of academic achievement for more than six terms. I would never get in as a student. <laughs> These students are seated on the platform and I ask that they come forward individually as their names are called. Robert Sellers, Vice Provost for Equity and Inclusion, Chief Diversity Officer, and the Charles D. Moody Collegiate Professor of Psychology and Education will introduce the students. This first group of students has achieved seven consecutive terms of all A's. Kavya Adiga. Angelina Bilby. Shira Brandhandler. Tiffany Chin. Allison Chu. Kristen Kimmer. Kaylin Delonis. Andrew Dimko. Adam Eckberg. Skyler Gleason. Emily Jean Iwanski. Chin Leong. Charlie Moore. Anna Morrison. Stavi Notchum. Anjali Nemorin. Serafina Provenzano. Gracia Cairoga. Matthew Rabinowitz. Bethany Ruckus. <laughs> Catherine Schubert. <laughs> Rebecca Turnapole. <laughs> Daniel Vonneberg. Victoria Weistepik. <laughs> Kevin Zhu. <laughs> Mackenzie Zero.
Louise Rangel de Costa. My apologies. <laughs> the next group of students have achieved eight, eight consecutive terms of all A's. <laughs> Nicholas Mastrusario. Cody McKay. Sierra Wolfkosten. And now our final students have achieved 10, 10 consecutive terms of all A's. Claire Yerman. very pleased to give special recognition to three students this afternoon. Each has achieved great academic success and has coupled it with leadership and service that makes important contributions to society. The Marshall Scholarship is named after General George C. Marshall, Jr. and provides opportunities for students from universities across the United States to study at universities in the United Kingdom. The program is founded in the belief that it will foster deeper understanding and stronger connections between the two countries. This year, 48 students from the United States were selected as Marshall Scholars. We are very proud to have two of our students among them. Amanda Burkoff, a senior in LSA who is majoring in math, will attend the University of Cambridge to pursue a master's in theoretical mathematics. She will spend a second year in Britain to study for a master's in mathematics and computer science at the University of Oxford. Noah McNeil, also a senior in LSA, has a double major in physics and math science. He will study at the University of Sussex for his master's in science and technology and complete a second master's in nuclear engineering and policy at the absolutely superb Imperial College of London. Please join me again in congratulating both Amanda and Noah. We are also proud to recognize Carly Martin, who has been named a Raoul Wallenberg Fellow. Applause 
As noted in your program, the university's Wallenberg Fellowship was established in 2013. It honors Raoul Wallenberg, one of our most distinguished graduates. Mr. Wallenberg brought intellectual acuity and great curiosity about the world to his studies in architecture. A native of Sweden, he was in that country's diplomatic service during World War II. Stationed in Budapest, he worked quietly and effectively to coordinate, coordinate the rescue of thousands of Jews in Hungary by issuing protective passports and sheltering them in buildings he had designated as Swedish territory. The Wallenberg Fellowship provides a graduating senior with the opportunity to learn about and contribute to society through an independent project anywhere in the world. Kali is a senior in LSA with a double major in linguistics and gender and health. She will be spending a year in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia where she will learn about the lives of sexual assault survivors as they negotiate medical and legal institutional pathways to recover their health and to seek justice. She will work with women's advocacy groups and with health professionals at Menelik II Hospital, which has Ethiopia's first sexual assault center that provides integrated services to survivors. Please join me in congratulating Carla. In 1988, the Board of Regents established a series of professorships to recognize outstanding contributions to undergraduate education. Named after Arthur F. Thurnau, a student at Michigan from 1902 to 1904, these series of professorships is supported through a trust fund he left to the university. Mr. Thurnau wanted to return to the University of Michigan, something of value he gained from being an undergraduate student here. In that spirit, the Thurnau Professorship Program is designed to honor tenured faculty whose commitment to and investment in undergraduate teaching has had a demonstrable impact on the intellectual development of our students. It is now my pleasure to introduce the 2019 Thurnau Professors. Henriette Elvang, Professor of Physics in the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts. Bogdan Aperinu, Professor of Mechanical Engineering, Electrical Engineering, and Computer Science in the College of Engineering. <laughs> Sandra Levitsky, Professor of Sociology in the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts. Adam Simon, Professor of Earth and Environmental Sciences, College of Literature, Science and the Arts, professor, professor of Environment in the College of Literature, Science and the Arts, and the School for Environment and Sustainability. <laughs> Michelle Zint. Professor of Environment and Sustainability, School for Environment and Sustainability, Professor of Environment, College of Literature, Science and the Arts, and School for Environment and Sustainability, and Professor of Education in the School of Education. One of our 2019 Thurnau professors could not be with us here today, and we recognize her. Sandra Gunning, professor of Afro-American and African Studies, American Culture, English Language and Literature, Women's Studies, professor in the Honors Program in the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts. Each spring, we invite a Thurnau professor to address students at Honors Convocation. It is my pleasure to uh, introduce Professor Jason, Jason De Leon, Director of Undergraduate Studies in the Department of Anthropology. 
Professor de Leon was named a Thurnau Professor in 2018 in recognition of his outstanding teaching and contributions to anthropology, including his broad integration of archaeology, sociocultural anthropology, biological anthropology, and linguistics. Winner of a 2017 MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, Professor de Leon directs the Undocumented Migration Project, a long-term study of clandestine border crossings in southern Arizona, northern Mexican border towns, and the southern Mexico-Guatemala border. In his award-winning book, Land of Open Graves, Living and Dying on the Sonoran Desert Migrant Trail, he documents the suffering and sacrifices of migrants and challenges readers to confront the complexity of international migration and American policy. Professor De Leon, we thank you for your op opportune and influential scholarship and for your dedication to your students at the university. We're delighted that you will address us here today. Please come forward. It's a great pleasure to be here today to recognize your wonderful academic accomplishments. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that the University of Michigan resides on the traditional territories of the Three Fires people, the Ojibwa, the Odawa, and the Boduwami. As an undergraduate student, I was not able to attend my university's honors ceremony. This is mostly because I had an embarrassingly low GPA and an F on my transcript, uh, an F in anthropology, <laughs> the subject that I would eventually earn a doctorate in. 18 years later, I finally made it to the honors ceremony, and I want to dispel any rumors that I used a, a college admissions counselor to get here, okay? <laughs> I have encountered many of you wonderful people in this room through the course Anthropology 101, a 450 person lecture that I have taught here at the University of Michigan since 2011. I know firsthand how bright and driven you are and I am proud to have been momentarily in some of your orbits. I have no doubt that you will go on to do great many and interesting things. I'm not worried about your drive or your talent and I'm sure as hell not worried about your GPA. <laughs> However, and there's seemingly always a however, I just want to leave you all with a couple of things to think about as some of you, many of you in this room, go off out into the real world very soon. As you well know, to say that we are living in difficult or divisive times is an understatement. Some days it feels like our country is literally ripping at the seams. America is being forced right now to recognize that racism, xenophobia, homophobia, Islamophobia, misogyny, and many other troubling societal ills are just under the surface of our cultural veneer. It's a veneer that often naively proclaims that we are the land where anyone's dreams can come true. America is also becoming acutely aware that our world is suffering from a global migration crisis a crisis that we are directly implicated in. And it's a crisis that only looks to get worse as political instability, war, economic inequality, and the devastating impacts of global climate change continually force people to leave their homes in search of something better, or at least something less lethal. The US-Mexico border is a place where Americans can see the faces of truly desperate people people who are telling us that if we don't help them, they will die of starvation in Mexico, or they will die from gang violence in places like Honduras. We live in a moment where we, especially you young people, who will inherit these problems, we have to make an important decision. We have to decide if we are going to replace Emma Lazarus's famous words at the base of the Statue of Liberty. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free. Are we gonna replace those words with the phrase, 
build a wall. As someone who has been knee deep in immigration issues for over a decade, I know that the world is on fire right now. But keep in mind, it's been on fire for a long time. However, I refuse to admit, admit defeat. I refuse to allow the words at the base of the Statue of Liberty to be edited like a scene out of George Orwell's Animal Farm to say something like, all immigrants are equal, but some immigrants are more equal than others. But my refusal is not based on any personal delusions of grandeur that I or some other lowly anthropologist can change the world and make things right. Since the end of that dark year that we call 2016, I have been motivated and inspired by many of you in this room. Young people who refuse to let the rest of us give up hope or allow hatred and ignorance to rule. You have shown me in the classroom and on campus that your generation is ready to fight for a better and a more just society. And I thank you for contaminating us old people with your hope. I brought up my own sordid academic past in the beginning of this brief monologue because I want you to know that there are many paths to dream careers and more importantly, there are many paths to fulfillment and happiness. Not all of those paths are direct and most of them are not easy. But I know that all of you in this room are gonna get there because you've already shown us what you can do, which is why you're here today. You give my generation faith in the future, and I wish you all the best of luck. Thank you.
I've seen its muddy bosom turn all golden in the sunset. I've known rivers, ancient dusky Thank you, Samantha and Robbie. And now I am pleased to present Mark Schlissel, the 14th president of the University of Michigan. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm really proud to offer a big University of Michigan congratulations to our honor students from the Ann Arbor, Dearborn, and Flint campuses. Let's give them another round of applause. To succeed at this level on campuses like ours is extraordinary and is evidence of your focus, your work ethic, and your talent. So well done, honor students. Congratulations also to your parents and families. Raising a scholar takes work and devotion, and I commend you for nurturing the talent and commitment of these students. I add my utmost congratulations to the Thurnau professors recognized here today as well. Uh, one of the most impressive qualities of the University of Michigan faculty is their outstanding commitment to undergraduate education. Let's give a round of applause to the Thurnau professors. <laughs> Remarkable teaching is deeply embedded in the U of M culture and is an integral component of our more than 200 year legacy as a great public university. We proudly see the results of that teaching in the students whose achievements we celebrate today. So thank you, Thurnau professors, for your outstanding contribution to education at Michigan. I want to give a special shout out to Allison Berry and the amazing student group, We Listen. Uh, I first learned of We Listen two years ago during one of my fireside chats with students. And Allie and another student then came to my office hours and shared their plans and the progress they had made. So it's so heartening to hear about the growth and impact of We Listen not that many months later. All around our nation, we're struggling with something that should be second nature, the freedom and comfort to discuss contentious and challenging topics. Perhaps it's a symptom of our times as we live in an era of great political polarization, one in which we can readily tune into information of a defined slant, serving to reinforce what we already believe. One of my hopes is that the University of Michigan community will always be an inalienable forum for discovery, debate, and discussion, a place where respect and disagreement can coexist, where each makes the other stronger, and where we all advocate for and learn from their confluence. So today's very thoughtful perspectives on the theme of our convocation, civility, dissent, and compromise in a divided world, are incredibly important. Last month, our state and nation lost a public servant whose career embodied this theme, 
John Dingell was the longest serving member of Congress in U.S. history, and he was our congressman. During his more than 59 years in office, he was essential to passage of landmark legislation, including the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, the Civil Rights Act, the Clean Air Act, and the Clean Water Act. He authored legislation that made mammograms safer and removed asbestos from schools. And the list of accomplishments goes on and on. Serving in Congress for nearly six decades, he also had plenty of political opponents. It's what he did working alongside those of differing political ideologies that I want to address today. The former Republican Speaker of the House, John Boehner, served with Representative Dingell for nearly 24 years. It's safe to say they often found themselves on opposite sides of issues. But Boehner praised his colleague's legacy during last month's memorial service. Dingell, he said, was driven by the notion that congressional service is an act of coming together and finding common ground necessary to advance the interests of our country. Every significant piece of legislation Dingell pushed required compromise. One example is Medicare. We know it today as a health insurance program primarily for people over age 65. Before it was passed in 1965, almost 20 million Americans found it nearly impossible to obtain coverage due to their age. As the National Academy of Social Insurance reported in 2001, there were simply sharply differing views on how to help them. That report features conclusions from a study panel that included then U of M law school professor Sally Ann Payton. It notes that organized labor, congressional Republicans, and the American Medical Association were at odds with political clashes over states' rights, civil rights, what to cover, and of course, how to pay for it. But on its way to becoming law, the Medicare bill passed the House of Representatives 313 to 115. And presiding over that House vote was a 36-year-old Congressman John Dingell. As the report says, the story of enacting Medicare is one of persistent political struggle and 11th hour compromise. John Dingell's career demonstrates that compromise does not mean giving up one's principles. Beginning in 1957, he introduced a bill at the beginning of every Congress to provide national health insurance. That continued for decades after the passage of Medicare, and in 2010, he sat beside President Obama during the signing ceremony for the Affordable Care Act. It's my hope that Dingell's brand of principled compromise will live on through the rising generation, through members like you who leverage their honors, achievements, and talent to recognize and respect our shared humanity. The data show plenty of opportunity in our world. In advance of last year's midterm election, a Marist College PBS and NPR poll showed that 79% of Americans said they're concerned or very concerned that the negative tone of national politics will prompt violence. That sentiment was strong across Democrats, Republicans, and independents. Yet the Pew Research Center reports that Americans are more inclined to prefer politicians who stick to their positions than those who make compromises with people they disagree with. This is a 53 to 44 percent finding, is a reversal from data less than a year earlier, when 58 percent of the public favored compromise. I worry what this rapid change in sentiment might mean for our nation and for its governance. That our ability to create consensus is needed to confront big problems is being diminished. That we would rather remain entrenched in the comfort of those who agree with us than take the risk to collaborate and to compromise. I believe these data speak to a nation that will need your ability to seek principled compromise as you take on a much bigger role in civic life in the years ahead. There is a ray of hope, however, brought to light by Michigan research. Tom Avacco of the Center for Local, State, and Urban Policy in our Ford School of Public Policy found a place where dialogue is much healthier. The school's Michigan Public Policy Survey revealed that 71% of Michigan local leaders reported that discourse amongst elected officials is generally constructive 
which is consistent result with results from back in 2012. As Ivaco wrote in a column for the website Governing, this appears to show that worsening national conditions haven't yet pushed local politics over the partisan edge, at least in Michigan. As honor students, you've learned the skills of thoughtful analysis, you've mastered the processes of inquiry, and developed your talents in ways that you can help, help you set a lofty standard for leadership. You have the ability to understand different points of view, to address dissent civilly, and to compromise for the good of society without abandoning your principles. As University of Michigan honor students, you've taken the hard road to get here, and I'm fully confident that you'll not take the easy way out by falling prey to demonization and demagoguery. You're ready to embark on the persistent struggle for principled compromise and to find the common ground that will advance and honor our highest principles as a society. So thank you all very much. And congratulations once again on your outstanding academic careers here at Michigan and Go Blue. As we close the formal program today, it is my pleasure to invite you to join our honorees for a reception at the Michigan League just across Ingalls Mall. Thank you for being present to share in this important occasion. It is wonderful to come together to recognize the accomplishments of our students in every field of inquiry and to honor their teachers. We salute all of their achievements. Our special thanks to the students and faculty from the School of Music, Theater, and Dance for their outstanding performances. The Trombone Choir, Samantha Williams, soloist, Robbie Bain, pianist, Assistant Professor Tiffany Ng, carillonist, and Professor James Kibbe, organist. We ask that the audience remain in their seats until the recessional march of the platform party has been completed. Please stand and sing with us as we close with the university's alma mater, the yellow and blue. You'll find the words printed in your program.